Dr. Carol Francis Talk Radio Show. Let's make life happen together with authors, scientists, researchers, both inside the box and outside the box of understanding so that you can live a life full of your success, curiosity, enjoyment, happiness, and richness of life in every respect. Let's go beyond our limits and let's help others go beyond their limits as well. Welcome. Well, good Good, good day, everybody. Those of you that are listening in the morning, good morning as well. This is Dr. Carol Francis, and I had the good fortune to be able to talk to Mike Rogalski on this topic, remote viewing, which is comparable and contrastable with any psychic phenomena or astral projection processes, is going to be specifically valuable to you because you will begin to understand that the powers or capacities you possess Inside of you, your brain, your capacities are barely tapped into, but we now have many sciences, many techniques that have been used and proved on a governmental level and on many other levels as well to be able to explore the world around you with your mind or your consciousness. So Mike Rogalski, who has written on this, has a wonderful website and mostly is a fabulous teacher on the topic of remote viewing, is here to inspire you, but also to instruct you as to what amazing talent you have locked up inside of your brain that yet hasn't discovered these capacities. So welcome, Mike Rogalski. I'm so glad you could be on the Dr. Carol Francis Talk, sh- Talk Radio Show. It's a pleasure to be here. And you pretty much said everything I was going to say, so I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you have so much to teach us, Mike. For one thing... We don't really know what remote viewing is. Uh, it, it, we, we hear maybe the term kind of says it, like a remote control, but what is remote viewing, Mike? Well, the, the term remote viewing has been used for too many things that have nothing to do with the original scientific descriptions. So if you, if you look at it, it's listed separately as a, a psychic cari- category in scientific journals. Uh, where where things are very narrowly defined, like clairaudience and clairsentience and so forth. and But people are keep using this term as a buzzword for things that they want to teach. And so I'd, I'd like to get down to what it actually is and, and where you can go for sources on it, as well as, you know, our, our uh, website. According to Dr. Keep Russell away. Card, Help us out. Uh, the, the originator of the research and development of RV, there's about 11 courses out there that teach the real remote, uh, real controlled remote viewing protocol. And he says that all these uh, systems work. So to say that only one of them is the best or one only, only one works is not true. Now, I, I can't speak for others who have added the term to their products, uh, but you can know this, that uh, if you're looking for the right course, all you need to do is look for the original people who are involved in the remote viewing uh, uh, project in, in the military, in the CIA, and people like Courtney Brown, Ed Dames, David Morehouse, Paul Smith, and Lynn Buchanan. And those, those people will, will uh, uh, set you on to the, the controlled remote viewing uh, course uh, as I teach it on our, in, in our classes and the website. It's not visualization. It's not imagination or dowsing or pendulums or anything like that. In fact, Paul Smith teaches dowsing and pendulums, and he's... Uh, is also a remote viewing teacher. So he's making a clear distinction that these other things are not what, what, what people think are remote viewing. So now that we got that clear, let me, let me talk about um, what uh, remote, how we do a remote viewing. To begin with... Well, sir, uh, well, but, well, what it, is it, remote viewing then? What, what, what happens uh, when it, you're remote viewing? What does it feel like or what, what, what are the outcomes of remote viewing? Well, it, it's a very subtle thing. If you compare it alongside of um, psychic uh, cognition, or you know, I, I've had psychic visions, and I know the difference between those and remote viewing. And, and sadly, remote viewing is not as spectacular as psychic vision is. It's not in technicolor. It isn't uh, all uh, very comprehensive and persuasive in its presence. You know, you, you can. See, with psychic visions, you can see 360 degrees around you and all the detail, and you can look at it. If, if you're fast enough, uh, you can catch every detail about it, and you've pretty, pretty much done your session in about 10 seconds. 
But in remote viewing, for those people who don't have that ability right away, uh, it's a good stepping stone. Controlled remote viewing will get you started in learning how to uh, uh, tune up your psychic abilities and your intuition to be able to see things. But they, but in remote viewing, uh, I think it's very valid that they've categorized it separately because it's not as distinct as a psychic vision or clairaudience or you know seeing ghosts and things like that. It's it's a little bit more subtle, but it's a wonderful introduction into the world of psychic ability. But as they say in First Corinthians 13, that for now we see through a glass darkly. Uh, that's a very good way to uh, describe how you see things in remote viewing. It's it's like taking a picture with an old brownie camera and jerking the camera just as you take the picture. You know, it's in black and white and it's blurry and it's not clear and distinct. But when you start using these processes uh, sequentially and you start addressing each thing like what do I see, what do I hear, what is the temperature, how do I feel about it, uh, you start listing those things on paperwork. It's very paper intensive. And as you add these things together, they are subjective things that you're putting down on paper. And in the process, you find yourself um, collecting a set of things that may begin to become coherent. Although we, we, we frown on the idea of anyone using logic or rationale early on in the process. That's not the point to do it. Because psychically, if you start uh, saying, oh, I know what it is, you've immediately cut off the psychic train, the, you know, the signal line, as we call it. And so you, you stay open and you remain as an observer and not as a judge of the material that, that is uh, coming in. And as long as you allow, the, the signal line remains strong and it will continue to uh, elaborate. You can elaborate on many things you see. But we never assign a form or a function to any of those um, observations, at least not early on. Uh, we want to keep that train open, so we, we do, the, do it that way. Okay, so before you kind of tell us what the prerequisites are uh, to learning remote viewing, I'm going to give you three experiences, and I want to see how you would classify each of these in terms of remote viewing, psychic reading or uh, a perception or astral projection because I actually teach people to do astral projection which I find to be different than remote viewing but let's see if we can get like a phenomenological description how it is experienced by people so remote viewing the time I've been as successful at that in terms of using the protocol you are about to teach us um, there was a unidentified photograph of something hidden in a file and it was placed on the table, and we went through the procedure you're going to teach us. And I went through the procedure and was able to get the materials, the shape, and the color. So it was pink, and the materials were ceramic, it was cold, hard, and it was in a circular form. And he opened it up, and, and lo and behold, there it was, a pink toilet seat. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so I would consider that remote viewing. Second experience, I'm sitting in this room, and I'm around, and we've just gotten through with a medium reading, and suddenly there's three people standing next to me, but I have this incredible swimming experience that these three people, that I'm swimming in each of their realities, past, present, and future. And it happened in a matter of 10 seconds, but it was so profoundly detailed, experiential, 3D. Um, it was like more of a narrative, a process that was about this person's life. So that would be my next experience. And finally... I was practicing astral projection where I felt myself suddenly in my astral body present, not in a physical form, but feeling very present physically in the scene where I was at trying to interface with people who were actually in 3D physical form. Okay, those are three experiences, Mike. Which ones are remote viewing? Which one's psychic? Which one's astral from your point of view? And what are some experiences of remote viewing you can describe so people can kind of get a feeling for what they're about to uh, move toward or experience when they are viewing something remotely. Um, so which one of those is remote viewing? What are some of your examples? Well, I, I think it would help to explain at the onset that there are two kinds of remote viewing. One is eyes open, trance-free, non-hypnotic kind of uh, uh, paperwork pushing that you would you 
would say is, is akin to writing a book about okay. something and you drive, you know, you're culling from your, in, your uh, not Im- so much imagination, but intuition, uh, writing down things that come to you. Uh, and then there is extended remote viewing, which is a trance state uh, type of, uh, uh, it's an ultra state of consciousness that down around uh, theta and delta, uh, the band of uh, the brain waves. rapid eye movement area that down around theta and delta that, that are uh, enable you to go out of body and to go to another location and under the control of a monitor, a person who is directing your your activities uh, while you're in that, that frame of mind, you can go to, to other locations and that was done very effectively uh, both during the Cold War and probably even till today. But uh, it, the thing about remote so viewing... Is that second one you just mentioned akin to astral projection, where you actually feel yourself being physically, uh, yet in your astral body, present in a 3D experience? Is that similar to remote viewing or in that second approach, or are you still saying there might be a distinction? Well, uh, there are people that are, you know, in defining that, there are people from who, who like to do out-of-body experiences they say that is distinct from the, the remote viewing kind of uh, aspect because you're on your own and uh, you're, you're aware that you're dreaming, but you're doing whatever you want. Whereas in remote viewing, you have somebody controlling your process for you, and and they are responsible for taking you higher or lower in the, the brainwave state so that they can you know they can fine tune the activities that they need you to be doing. So. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there, there are differences, and, and just like the differences between astral projection and out of body experiences, there is a, there are different worlds that you go to, and, and different levels of experience. Like uh, one example I can think of is that in, in uh, uh, certain uh, out of body experiences, you can go beyond the familiar physics that we have now and walk, go through walls. And do you know violate all kinds of things? In fact, to find yourself in the complete absence of the familiar physics that we we live with, and right. and, and on the other hand, you have uh, environments in which you can experience things predictably by having an expectation that you you know when you land, you're going to land on some kind of solid object. So th- those are often a different category, and I don't teach that because. Uh, it's a, it's very hard to arrive at, and I I've just barely managed to to uh, do astral travel and out of body experiences on my own. But I have to say that for the, the few minutes of of ex- or moments of experiences that they are, they are they're like life changing experiences. You know, to find yourself right. you know uh, up on the ceiling, looking at yourself sleeping, and have something come through the wall at you is uh, it's different. You know? mm-hmm. That's right. Well, remote viewing is also life-changing as well. It's a very, from my point of view, Mike, it's a very cognitive, perceptual process. Um, so that's why I'm trying to let people know, hey, these, this experience of remote viewing is actually one of your many, many, many tools you can use to move out of your body's limitations. So let's, um, well, what are the prerequisites to, to learning how to do remote viewing? Let's start with that. What's the prerequisites? Anybody, our listeners would need to none. And Ah, one of the things, um, my my dog is having a remote vision of my wife arriving. Anyway, uh, I'm having a hard time hearing you there. What did you say? I'm sorry. uh, My my wife uh, just came in, and and my dog is having remote visions of her arriving. So I'm my psychic dog. there's practically no prerequisites. You do have to believe that it's possible and uh, have an open mind about it and not be in any, in any emotional or physically disabling condition uh, because uh-huh. remote viewing, in, you know, in eyes open remote viewing requires a calm and clear mind that's undistracted and quieted enough to uh, sense very subtle nuances of intuition arriving. And, you know, if you just had a fight with the wife, that's not a good time to try to do a session, because a lot of remote viewing, uh, eyes open remote viewing is, uh, and and that's what we're going to primarily be talking about here. Um, all of it requires a, a sense of tranquility, you know, like still waters, and the ability to be able to hear things 
things that are very, very subtle in intuition, you know, very subtle nuances coming in. So uh, mm-hmm. any distractions are going to mess you up. And mm-hmm. I, I guess I should say here that out of all the drugs you should not be taking, the one that research has found affecting you, you, RV skills the most is, wait for it now, wait for it, marijuana. Mm-hmm. THC affects the brain centers that you need the most, so you have to make a choice there. Do you want to uh, see how slow your watch can turn, or do you want to be able to go out into the universe and, and see things far, far away? Mm-hmm. And a lot of people have had to make decisions like that, and they decided that mm-hmm. they're going to stay with marijuana. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, and right. now <laughs> one of the things that helps is to come into, uh, uh, as a prerequisite, to have some meditation skills. Uh, being able to quiet your mind down to that point where you're working effectively in remote viewing is, uh, it takes a while to de- develop that skill. Mm-hmm. Because it is eyes you open know. and there's no trance state involved, and so there, there isn't anything to keep you from wandering off into other frames of mind. So it's, mm-hmm. it's really important to uh, do that. But other than that, uh, people don't realize that. Well, people tend to think that they they are not skilled enough to be able to do this, but the truth is that one out of 25 people are exceptionally psychic. Hmm. And that translates to 10 million people walking down the street today that Mm -hmm. have psychic skills that are exceptional. And many of those people are CEOs who are making good business decisions and they don't even know why. So the beauty of Eyes Up and Remote Viewing is that it's a very gentle stepping stone into a world of of uh, cognitive abilities that are beyond the physical boundaries that we're accustomed to. And mm-hmm. in the process, uh, you learn a whole lot about yourself. And it, it's it's just really mind-boggling. I, you know, I'm thinking that the times that I've had success doing remote viewing versus the times where it was just random, <laughs> where was I, you know, my own imagination, I, I, I can kind of detect that I was in a very different, I'm, I want to say almost a location in my brain, in my inside my brain, um, as if I were uh, activating a whole different series of brain functions come yeah. together, coalesce yeah. together to be able to, and vigor, enable me to do that. I think that part of remote viewing training is in part to help you know where you locate that. I'm, I'm an old person, so I think about a record player. You would put that arm down on a certain bandwidth on the record to hear just that specific song, but you had to know which one it was. And that's kind of the way it feels when I do remote viewing successfully. So yeah, how does that right. sit with your students? Uh, I, I try to teach the students that when when you're doing meditation, to close your eyes and to focus uh, just slightly above, like in your your eyebrow, up near your eyebrows, or in pineal gland for that matter, uh, and mm-hmm. uh, try to just relax. And if any visions are going to come in, they come in from there. Because when, when I started, I mean, I was I was I'm amazed, frankly, that I jumped through so many hoops not knowing what I was doing. But one of the things I did was uh, for the first six months, I scoured the back of my skull with my eyeballs, thinking that somehow mm-hmm. I was going to see something up there. And, and right. in reality, and, and this makes it really simpler, uh, it, when you realize that it's not a place in your, your skull, that it's a place in your mind, you could find it a lot easier. It's a place mm-hmm. in your mind. And uh, your mind. By, by practicing that and by practicing meditation to arrive at the you know, that that open frame of mind, uh, you arrive here rather quickly. And, mm. and there's something that I did the other day that surprised me. I, I was taking Gerald O'Donnell's uh, course in remote viewing, which I, I have to say is it, it's extended remote viewing. It's higher caliber than anything I, I recommend that people start with uh, if, if you're totally unfamiliar with psychic ability. But one of the things he teaches is to go down to the, the REM state of mind in about 10 seconds. And I've measured that with an EEG, and I found that, yes, it is true. That's where I go that quickly, mm, yeah. you know, under hypnotic uh, uh, control. I can go down mm-hmm. to that. And what I discovered the other day was that I was my, my eyes are twitching. And I, mm-hmm. I said, well, of course they're twitching. This is down at a rapid eye movement state. 
you know, I don't go mm-hmm. unconscious. I'm not I'm not floating around in a, a big jungle, but but what I do do is I I can get down to a very tranquil state of mind in about ten seconds, mm-hmm. and that comes from a lot of training. You know, so yep. it, it, you're not going to get something for nothing. But if you take a long mm-hmm. time to train, you will find that when you're ready to remote view, you can get down to that place very quickly. And it, it's really worth it. Right. You know, I think that we, for so long, assumed that since there are those a select few people that do this naturally, almost unwillingly at times, that therefore they have a talent we don't, or they're so suspect as being a fraud, you know. But what you have to offer here is that regardless of how easy this is or isn't for you, there are protocols that will exercise you into that capacity. So no one needs to be left out in the cold on this, which I think is very, very exciting. Yeah, it is. And and I, I found, well, I have some very high-level teachers that teach me, you know, have been trying to teach me, or try to teach me mystical things. And and one of the, I, I think the, the dirty little secret of psychic ability is practice. It's that simple. Right. Because my teacher, who I, uh, she, she goes to the Akashic Records and turns the pages. You know, that's, that's the kind of person she is. She right. told me that she had no psychic ability whatsoever, but she wanted to. And so she practiced. And she was very diligent in her practice, and that's the difference. There's a lot mm-hmm. of people that say, well, if, if I told you that it takes six months to really come up with some really good results in, in remote viewing, that they just won't even bother. You know, they're so mm-hmm. accustomed to the uh, uh, I want it now thing that, that it's, they don't want to work that hard for it. So I've worked hard, and I have the abilities yeah. I have. Luckily, because I, I, I am, I, I'm not one of those twenty, one out of twenty-five. I'm, I'm, neither am I mediocre, but I'm somewhere in between. And I've had to work to be able to develop the skills that I have. But that's the good news. You know, anybody that is has a modicum of ability and, and a lot of determination can can learn how to remote view and and develop All right. abilities. Well, uh, Mike, you're getting us all so excited. we got to teach these people how to do this. And we're just going to take a little moment of a segue, and then we're going to get into the steps that you would recommend people doing and where okay. to go on the Internet. I know you have a blog. I know you have a website. Folks, he also has a class, which he's going to be actually teaching this Saturday. I will be there. if I can possibly organize my work schedule around it. And it's going to be in El Segundo. And, Mike, you're going to tell us the websites, the locations, how they get in touch with you and your tools. And then let's just dive into actual giving us the steps we can implement in order to become remote viewers. All right, Mike, how do we get in touch with you and all of your tools? All right. Um, You want me to begin now? Yes. Yeah, tell us us first how we get in touch with you and your class. Uh, Oh, okay. Uh, first of all, we're at meetup.com in Los Angeles, and uh, okay. the, the name of the website on meetup.com is SCARVS, S-C-A-R-V-S, that's Southern California Association of Remote Viewing Systems. It's the same word as the regular way you would spell SCARVS without the E. And once you go to meetup, you can you can join up, and you have to RSVP for the club because we have to produce materials for each student. So it's you know, it shows a certain uh, amount of uh, organization to let us know that you're coming. But you have a good class coming up here. Yeah, so there's a class coming up uh, this coming uh, Saturday in uh, Pasadena. I don't know what the, the air data will be, but uh, they're all posted, all of the meetings are posted on the Meetup site, and all you have to do is become a member. And there's no obligations and there's no cost. Everything is free. Uh, and Amazing. I do that because I want to... <laughs> Pardon me? Amazing. <laughs> That's a really nice yes, gift. Yes. It's a scarf. It's a sort of scarf you wear around your neck. And you think it's in Pasadena, June 14, 2014. I will be yes. there, folks, and I will let you know more information about it. If you cannot come, we will try to get information to you so that you can come in the future. How else do they get in touch with you, Mike? Well, the, the website is main, the main means by which I make contact because uh, I I don't know who I'm going to be in touch with. So that they, they shields me a little bit from any undesirables. But the amazing thing is that I've never had any undesirables. I just, uh, <laughs> but it can happen. Filled, yeah, the club's filled with wonderful, wonderful people that have yeah. different uh, abilities. And that's why I formed the club is because I wanted to have uh, 
I wanted to get to know other people who both were interested in remote viewing and, and as well had psychic skills. And as a consequence, we have a, a very select group of people that can do some amazing, amazing work. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I did a Where's Waldo, and uh, my A team came out with, uh, uh, you know, I gave them, there's a photograph of me standing in a Russian submarine in Long Beach Harbor uh, next to the Queen Mary. And when they were, they were done, uh, they had drawn the Queen Mary, a submarine next to it, from the, not from the point of view where the people come into the, the, the ship, but from the other side, and from the harbor, which you've always been using. And uh, they they said that I was standing in a in a on the second floor, bottom floor of something with a rounded floor on the bottom of it, and there were tubes and uh, propellers, and, and I was actually in the torpedo room of the Russian sub. And so that was my 70th birthday gift they gave me. They they found me. I that was a photograph I had taken two weeks earlier in a sealed envelope, and it is just utterly amazing. That is, that's a, a great example. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> and there's, there's so many more, you know. I I, I was always fighting a, a little touch of insanity or anxiety because I realized that this stuff was real. And it, it, it'll change your world. But fortunately, remote viewing is a subtle way to enter into that. And, you know, you get a, a couple of nuances here. Well, I got that right. I got this right. And, and until finally you arrive at the point where you get a target that is, absolutely spot on and then you say wow and I, I still feel a little crazy when I do those that well <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, yes absolutely because we're just so used to telling ourselves we can't we can't we can't as opposed to oh we can okay so Mike it's time for you to teach us a step so it's the first thing that we do okay well we start off with with meditation and okay. uh, that gets us down into an alpha state of self, conscious self-awareness and simply being completely aware of it. nothing outside you uh, except that you are aware that there are uh, of some of your senses that can possibly be sending you some information, and so you keep open to that. Uh, okay. We try to keep the room subdued and light because our eyes take up about 35% of our brain's processing to, you know, to comprehend its environment. So we, we, we uh, bring, uh, subdue the light quite a bit, try to avoid bright colors and distracting objects and, and, and other people and noise going on, and minimize, and, you know, just like in any meditative ability, to minimize the number of sensory inputs we have cooking at any particular time. And then we do, uh, we write down any precog that comes to us during this meditative period on, on the, our first sheet of paper. And in class, we have forms, but the ideal is to work with blank sheets of paper. It's, the forms are just designed so that we can learn how to use those things, you know, you know in the sequence. And then, you know, you start out with seven pages of blank paper and, and you go from there. So and you said the next, uh, the, the next step is, yes. wait, wait, before you go on, Mike, describe what a precog is. Because you say that as if all of us are right on the same page. But what? So you want them to all ask they've gotten into this meditative conscious self-awareness where they can tune into their own perceptual tools and yet not be uh, blinded by the surroundings that are that they're sitting in. And then they start writing down precogs. But what are precogs? What are those? What, 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 how would so you categorize precogs, what they well, look like? Uh, it is just as, you know, you could say that it is psychic vision except that it's like in black and white and it's an old 1930s sound system. And it, it's very uh, uh, pre- preliminary and uh, basic image that comes into your mind that, you, you know, suggests you... Well, I'll give you an idea of what it looks like. If you if you picked up a pen and put it in front of you and, and you looked at it for a moment and studied all the details about it and then closed your eyes and tried to recall all of that detail, that's approximately what you're going to see as a precog or as any other intuitive input. It, it's uh, black and white. It's not very distinct. It has a lot of nuance to it that you didn't pick up on, but you know basically what it's intended to be. Uh, A good example of that would be uh, I saw a tree with tree bark on it as a precog the other day, and what it was, the the target was was actually a a pile of telephone poles, 
Huh. So you get a precog, you know, you get a precognitive image like that. You may or may not. Okay, it's not an absolute a prerequisite. But if it comes to you, you write it down, and then you draw a line under it, and then you, and, and that separates what you you receive as as something that's just outside the edge of the rainbow viewing process, and you put your pen down, and that's called a break. And then you pick your pen up again to say, okay, I'm done with that idea. I'm moving on to something new. And then what we do, we assign to you a target reference number, which is simply a number written on the back of a photograph or associated with an object uh, in such a clear way that the intention is very evident that this is the target and that is the number, and we're talking about the same thing. And, and as soon as you write down that number as it's presented to you, you go to an ideogram box, a little box drawn that, that allows for a squiggle. And this squiggle is about one second long. It's totally involuntary, but it's not automatic writing. Automatic writing takes a little bit of uh, uh, awareness of, of where your pen is going and so forth. This is just totally random. And when you, when you draw that, uh, that squiggle, then you, you uh, decode it. And what you'll say, okay, it's curving up over it, looping down and waving back and forth and diagonally down, or whatever you do. All right, and then we, we uh, say is we probe the, the uh, ideogram, and then we, we say, all right, uh, is it man-made or natural? And what is the texture of it? And we write down the texture. And then we do that same process again. We start with the target reference number, and we write it down, and then we immediately go to another target uh, box, another uh, ideogram box, and draw another one. And, and we do that three times. And the reason for that is this, the, one of the best sources of initial information for you to get an get a idea of where you're headed is by allowing your subconscious mind to draw a squiggle and tell you what the target is. And, and my experience is if you let it alone and let it, you know, just let it draw, uh, you will get an accurate representation of what the target is immediately. It's just that fast. It's instantaneous transfer of information. And the first thing, the reason why we use the ideograms is that the first thing that happens in the body when you receive a psychic uh, piece of information is it wants to, the body wants to move. So what we'll do is we'll take the, the, uh, that impulse and we translate it into what is eventually called a gestalt. And that's Carl Jung's way of saying uh, a, a very fundamental drawing that everyone in the universe or everyone on Earth, uh, according to his idea, uh, has. He had to conclude that it was something genetic within us that enabled everyone in mankind throughout all of history and all cultures and all geographic areas to draw the same objects uh, to represent the same thing. He couldn't get over that. But what it is, is it, it isn't because we have the same DNA. It's because we have the same psychic connection to everything in the universe. So we draw this object uh, identically, uh, and we, we can translate that from a list of ideogram, ideogramic drawings that define what the, the squiggle is. And when you do that, and you, when you've taken a, a, like a summary of all the ideograms from these three attempts, you start coming up with a very solid idea of what the target is is about. Is it man-made or natural? And is it, uh, what is the texture? When you probe the ideogram, you actually can get images or, or sense, you know, sense intuition about what the target is at that point. And then once we do that, we, we begin another session of uh, sensory and dimensional information. And they're listed, and we draw that information from a, a uh, word descriptor list. And so we, we don't have to logically arrive at what we think is. We just go through the words and the words that are associated with a particular characteristic like uh, texture or, or color and so forth, they will pop out uh, at us from the list. And it's a very subtle thing, but you, you get to the sense that those words are a little bit more special than all the others around them. And when you're done, you wind up with a, um, a set of words that will describe the target in a little bit more detail. And you go down to the dimensionals then, and you, you say, is it oblong, is it oval, is it uh, curving, is it concave? And, you know, and there are words that you don't have to think about. They're just all presented there for you to pick from. And once that's done, then you, you say, okay, how do I feel about the target? 
And, and one of the things that it took the you know, longest time to understand because there doesn't seem to be any logical connection between them is, is that the, the uh, what we call the AI or the aesthetic impact statement, the feeling of the target to see a visual representation of it, it translates through the heart chakra to tell us exactly what it's going to look like. And we, we put that down on the next page and we draw a 15-second sketch of what the the target is supposed to look like. And from that, uh, we begin an objective organization of all the information that we gathered. And at this point, we can start attempting logic uh, in, in the organizational process of it. And, and what happens is we're going from objective impressions to objective notes on paper. And, and for those people who see, uh, who understand how a to-do list works, you'll immediately understand how the subjective to objective thing goes. Because, you know, if you write down, today I have to cut the grass. Today I have to go to the store. But I don't want to cut the grass. No, but it, it's on the list. So you have to do it. And, you know, and so that takes away the emotion from the issue, and it gives you a, an objective list of things that are. And that's the same thing that we're doing in remote viewing. We're, we're taking objective things, subjective things and turning them into objects that we can manipulate. And then from that point, we take uh, the objective uh, organization that we've done and we start um, mind mapping some of these ideas. We start drawing upon uh, this word. What does this word emanate in our mind when we say this? And we'll make a list of, like, not exactly synonyms, but things that our particular brain, our mind, and all of our experiences have associated with uh, that particular word. And in that respect, uh, the way that, we, that each brain decodes the same thing, like if there are 10 remote viewers in a room, uh, the way we each associate with what the target is comes through a little bit differently. And that's what's always fascinating to me is that people can wind up with the same thing, but they came from a different direction. Hmm. And when all is said and done, then we do a written summary of all the things that we have sensed, and, and by putting it into a grammatical form, we we arrive at the um, unique position where we are uh, linking all these things together in in prose or in, you know in, in a summary fashion, and just doing that is another way of eliciting uh, coherent responses from the brain about what the target is, and we're done, and we send right off end of session, and after that end of session note. We're not allowed to add anything else to the paper, not even after the target, particularly after the target has been revealed. And it's that simple. So, uh, the pra so I'm thinking about how people listening will say, okay, well, how can I practice this? And you actually have it set up so people can go on a website. They can choose a target number, and then they can do a remote viewing type exercise. Of course, it's much easier after you've gone to one of your classes. But what is that website where people can uh, hook into that type of material or data that's provided for them? Well, there, there's a website called Panopticon on PsyDojo, that's P-S-I-D-O-J-O dot com. But okay. unfortunately, as much as I love the people there because they help, help me train so much, uh, their, their panopticon site where they assign a target reference number and then you do your session, then you come back and click on that, uh, it's not as reliable as it used to be. So what we do is in our club, uh, we have a, a target practice disc that we provide to our students and, and they can go into a folder and take a folder number and do a session with that and then open up that folder and see what the target is. And so it's, it's a simple pro uh, process. And it's a, a lot more reliable, unfortunately. You know, it's very disturbing to go through a whole session and find out that a webcam that, that you're, you're hoping to find is not functioning at the time. And that's what the problem <laughs> is with the right. Okay. So, again, folks, I, I would encourage you to get in touch with Mike through meet, meetup.com. And the name of the, the club you're going to look for is called Scarves, like the type of scarves you wear around your neck. Is that correct? But without the E. That's right. S C A R V. Okay. Yeah. Very or, good. Or, if you're, or you can go to go to the law. You know, I just say in the Los Angeles area, you want to find out about remote viewing, and you'll you'll uh, 
the the links that they will give you there for remote viewing almost always will include just us. I don't think you know, there are other people that claim remote viewing, but like I said, they're they're using a buzzword and it's not necessarily accurate. Well, this is a really helpful uh, delineation of different steps to take. And Mike, what do you think about the following kind of analysis that? You're taking them through one, moving them into a meditative state so their alpha brain functions are predominant. They're focused uh, in a, on a consciousness level as opposed to sensing all the data and information around them that they have to interact with in their physical form. So you're moving them into a receptive state. And then after they're receptive, you're kind of trying to get the debris or trash out of their their mind, putting that on the paper. And some of that debris or trash may actually be relevant to the target uh, photo or the target object, but may not be. It may just be noise, so to speak. And then you're moving them into well, this I, physical kind of experience through this ideogram. Yes, go ahead. Uh, well, I, I would be cautious about calling any of it trash because when, you know, it's bad enough that we get valid information and we say, well, I can't believe that that's accurate and, and people discard it. Uh, we, we allow everything to come in and we put it down on paper. And I should mention, I'm glad you mentioned the, the, the subject, but there, there are times when we know that we're being led by our imagination or by our left brain, and it's called analytical overlay. And what we will do is we will put down on the paper to the right-hand side where it says AOL on the forum, uh, anything that's a, a, a distraction, anything that we know is trying to drive the entire session from our left brain, uh, you know, rational mind. And then we put our pen down again to make a break, and then we pick it up again and we continue on where we are. But uh, I think it's far more important for a, a, a student remote viewer to accept everything that comes into the mind. Uh, they, we don't consider anything as trash unless we, we realize that it's consciously leading us. Now that may, okay, that is very, that's, that's nice, that's a nice distinction. I've heard it taught many different ways. I, I much prefer that. That way they can be receptive and receiving and accepting of everything. But one of the things I love about your training is that you that you really caution, you mentioned this really briefly a moment ago, you really caution from them becoming re rigidly adherent to just one perception or one defined object because that may become their imagination or their attitude that, that they become attached to, and becoming attached to something premature may stop them from receiving other information. Well, what is that like to sit there and say, no, no, I can't attach to this, and yet I can value that this has come well, to me? What, what <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's fun because a lot of people, I, I often say that the first thing that people learn uh, in remote viewing is what an AOL is, or analytical overlay. And it, what it, it, it'll just, you know, you're, you'd be surprised at how much your left brain wants to take over the whole session and say, look, I have blue, I have water, I have uh, sun, it's an ocean, you know, and, and, you, and your mind just wants to put this all together. So, so one of the things that I suggest when people are going through their sessions is to compartmentalize every single uh, sensory input and say, okay, what colors are we looking at right now? Now, the fact that I, I sense that there was water in the ideogram has nothing to do with what I'm trying to sense right now. And so you compartmentalize every inquiry you make to the, the uh, beyond and say, okay, what colors are involved? And you try to sense those and don't say, well, I should expect to see blue because water is involved. So, so I go through all these things and I do not allow what I've gathered up to this point to drive what I'm going to see the next in the next moment mm -hmm. in another category. And mm -hmm. it's that compartmentalization that keeps you from uh, assembling because the left brain wants to assemble things, draw conclusions, be rational, and you know, and do all these things that will take you in the wrong direction. And because mm -hmm. we're so accustomed to dealing with that, uh, it's very, very easy for us to, to get off on the wrong start. And, and that's why I say one of the first things you'll probably learn in remote viewing is what analytical overlay is. So then another experience that I'm wondering if it's related to analytic overlay is a little bit like when you're receptive to so many different signals at the same time, you don't know which one is the one you're trying to pay attention to. It's a little bit like the olden days when you'd be, have a party line and you'd have to tell everybody else to get off the party line so you could get your phone call through. Or when you're on, or on your cell phone and suddenly you're hearing other conversations, 
it's like, okay, no, wait a minute. I just want the conversation that I'm dialing into. So how does someone sift through all these different signals that they may be very perceptive to to say, oh, there's the target set of signals. There's the target set of perceptions or sensory input. Well, it, it, that's a very good question because it, it's something that you learn over time. And, and it's and it's always like a subtle nuance of like if an AOL is is creeping into your mind, it'll be like a subtle but persuasive inference or you know it, it's implicitly saying you've got to consider this and, right and and that kind of persuasion is is a bit too much. It tells you right away that you're being led by by AOL. And uh, the other things that come in, uh, we allow. To you know, when, when you're not certain of something is when it's usually right. That That's what we tell students because it, it's some of the some of the real things that come into our mind and some of the experiences I've had, I said, I can't believe that. That's, that's hard to believe. But that's the reason why it's valid is because it isn't something that our left brain is fabricating. It's coming in as a totally unexpected uh, observation. And and that nuance between AOL and, and the valid information, uh, will, there will always be a blurred line in between somewhere where you, you accept things. You can accept them tentatively. And, and in that way, then you can, find, you can let that go and say, okay, I hear you. I wrote it down. Now leave me alone. And you go on to, to other mental processes of, of uh, perception. And some things are... You know, I say I can't believe that I'm I'm writing that down, but I'm going to. And you find out later, you know, when the target is revealed, that you were absolutely right on. So we don't, you know, we don't do one one thing or the other. You know, we try to stay down the middle of the road and say, okay, this is what I'm sensing, and we don't question it, uh, except when it starts to become very persistent, and we're saying, you know, this is it, this is it, and we, we don't do that. All right, and that's how we overcome. The A O what they call AOL drive, or the tendency of the left brain to take over the session and say, "All right, I'm done. Here's what it is." I, I know that in the uh, the research, the government uh, ads work and uh, Morehouse's work, they talk they talk about that even the person that's handing you the target photo or you're saying, "Here's what you want we were here's what we want you to concentrate on." That's really the wrong word. Remote view on that even the person hands them is kept in the dark, uninformed as to what's inside the package or what the target is, so that people can't psychically read that person's mind. But at the same time, you're, you're connecting to someone's intentions, someone's uh, uh, saying, we're going to put this on in the envelope or we're going to put this on the site. Someone's intentions are present with the target that you are trying to connect to. How how does that impact um, reading the target, so to speak? Well, in, in the classroom situation, very often for the sake of, of guiding the students along in, in correcting any kind of errors they make as they're going, I have to, I, I like to know what the target is, and I tell them, look, if you if you read my mind with telepathy and you get it right, well, you get an A anyhow, right? But <laughs> because I mean that. That's another another avenue of light points for them to realize that they may have that capability through another channel. So I, I'm open to allowing them to learn anything about themselves as possible. But a very, in fact, very often we have we have somebody like right in front of somebody else is drawing they're drawing the same things. Right? They've got the same wrong impression because they're picking it up telepathically. So there's there's always that possibility that people are reading other people in the room, and uh, mm -hmm. in a in a very solid intelligence uh, situation, it's true. You, the monitor would not have the knowledge of what the target is, and and I am very. I just got a book the other day about uh, body language, and how you know I'm trying to learn how to not provide any kind of nuance to what the target is, but generally speaking. There isn't anything I say about the target that would lead you to understand what it is, except that I know what it is in my mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. like with a, the submarine target, um, they didn't know that it was me. 
They didn't know where I was, and they didn't know what it, or when it was. So there's absolutely no kind of nuance that I could have given away. Uh, and and I, just, I can't comprehend how a subtle body language might give that, a, you know, that much information under those circumstances. But I'm aware of it. I, I don't want to give it away. And I don't. I, re, I really suspect that I do not, in spite of how subtle body language can be. But even so, you know, if you pick up on some things, uh, you're not going to know. Again, I'm not going to make any kind of body language that says torpedo to tell her, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And they get it. Okay, you know, here's, they, they get here, the target, here's the... and, and it's, it, that level of kind of in, uh, information is not being transmitted through any kind of body language. Especially when okay, they do here... it time after time after time after time with, you know, the double blind targets. I know the people. Mm-hmm. We're that good. So here's another uh, dilemma I found myself in during my remote viewing experiences, and I'm wondering how you uh, organize this into things. When someone's taking a picture, the picture, the photograph captures a moment and looks very still because the photograph is still. Um, but I always get confused between am I supposed to see what I what am I supposed to remote view the photograph? or what the photograph is about. And the reason I I'd suggest that is that I tune into movement and motion. So mm-hmm. I am I am more I am more capable to say I uh, uh, talk about the movement and the motion, but the photograph doesn't have any movement or motion. And I find that to be a disconnect for me when I'm doing uh targets that are in envelopes. So okay, uh, well, what, what is your experience with that? It, it, that's a very good question, and one of the, and, and sometimes I fail to mention it in class. But we have a, what we call a convention, a conventional view of of uh, addressing the target, and that is, uh, you know, I could ask them, you know, what's in the envelope, and they'll say, I see a piece of paper with lots of ink on it, you know, and that would be, <laughs> of course, that would be correct, but it wouldn't be the answer you're looking for. So, so it's true, and. and Viewing, we have to specify the target, and we, when we have a, a few, we have a few conventions that we utilize that that are assumptions that you make when you're given a target. And in this case, uh, we say that the, the photograph. It, we want you to tell us what you see at the place where the photograph was taken at the time it was taken. So all of the things around it in 360 degrees of perception are valid. Uh, you know, they're gained. And uh, and the, the activities taking place at that moment are the are the valid ones. And I've done webcam targets where I said I see a bird flying, and just as I opened up the, the image from Panopticon, the uh, there's a bird flying just took off of a, a tree stump. Mm-hmm. So you know you you do get that very accurate. And one of the drawbacks of, of the photographs is that you don't have a live action immediate revelation, but we presume uh, two things, and this is why we have conventions. With a webcam target, uh, the, the convention is that you would say, all right, what will you see at the moment you you open up this, this webcam and you see the target? Mm-hmm. All right, and, you, and that gives you a more accurate feel for that moment. But we are, the good thing is that we're, we're capable of going at any place in time and space and say, all right, this is the... the uh, uh, moment that we want you to savor, and mm-hmm. that's the moment that you work with. So with photographs, it's when the picture was taken and 360 degrees around because the the, uh, the psychic mind, the, the um, pineal gland, is able to see in 360 degrees around you. And I've drawn things behind me and not known for sure what they were. But fortunately, mm-hmm. one, one very good target was uh, at the MGM Grant, and I saw the, the water fountain behind me, and it's absolutely right on the money if you go over there. I love to go over mm-hmm. there and take a look at the <laughs> And just recall yeah. it. And that, that's yeah. another cool thing. Because once you remote view the place, you know it. It's like you've mm-hmm. been there. And, and I went to Alaska uh, last, this past spring, and I was thrilled to realize I was pulling into a town where I had remote viewed. Mm-hmm. And it was like I had been there before. Mm. Wow. And it's really, really, really cool feeling. So that's mm. some of the exciting things that that happened with remote viewing. Mm. 
it, one time I was uh, remote viewing and the, the target turned out to be a trees and a bridge and, and, and a beautiful expanse of landscape area. And, and But my remote viewing was, was I felt this human being feeling very unsteady on their legs as they were crossing something that felt unsteady to him. And it was mm-hmm. a hill. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I'm so far <laughs> off on this. Took that photo and looked a little close, and there are these little people on the bridge. And I thought, okay, who knows? Maybe that's what I was uh, able to receive. But at the same time, it just seemed like such an element of the experience uh, as opposed to the overall gestalt of the photo. So when you talk about conventional view of perception, that is a that's an that is worthy of, of trying to understand. I know that when I've read the books on this, that they often talk about how they emotionally experience the presence of things and that that, um, that clouds and yet that also informs them. How about those emotions, the feelings? Well, like I had the emotion of fear. Are, uh, we, we use several uh, different points in the process. One is called the uh, aesthetic impact and another one is called the emotional impact. And the aesthetic impact is how do you feel about the target looking at it from a distance? But the emotional impact is how do you feel right in the midst of everything that's going on in the target, at the target mm-hmm. site? And that's a little bit more involved. And, and, and we progressively take you up to that point because of, uh, you know, it may get a little bit more intense right at the target site. But we, in, in training, we try to never ever come up with like the the crash of the Hindenburg or the, you know, uh, 9/11 uh, World Trade Center uh, event, because we don't want you. You could feel some things very real as though you were right there when it happened, and that we feel that that's a negative uh, training situation for people, and that they may have you may develop an aversion to wanting to go to any site not knowing what's there. So that, that's always been a rule. Lynn Buchanan is always held by that in his, his training back in uh, uh, Grill Flame and uh, uh, Stargate uh, to, ne- to never come up with negative targets uh, until a person is very well trained in uh, working with, you know, run-of-the-mill things. But you will find emotional involvement with the target and many times, and that's good. And, and in fact, we consider that as a, a, a primary... Uh, Requisite, you know, to be able to feel feel the target emotionally. Well, that's interesting. You know, I, I would I suspect being a psychologist and watching people's styles, I'm very tuned into when I'm working with individuals to know their style of change or progression or evolution or issue resolution is going to be very specific to their personality, their brain function styles. Um, even, well, I'll just give examples, like some people are visually oriented, so I use visual language, or some people are auditory, or some people are emotionally oriented. So I will predominantly communicate in the language of their style so that they mm-hmm. can more optimally change because they can grasp quicker on the level, uh, on that level than any other level. And I would wonder if people, when they remote view, also bring their styles of perception and that some perceptive styles and skills are going to be more naturally present and developed than others. And so maybe one person is emotionally sensitive, another one's visually, another one's in terms of movement and shapes. And I mean, do you have a way for people to kind of decode what their initial proclivity is going to be so they can appreciate the skills that are already so available for them to use? No, I I think there's a problem in that, uh, uh, what were you know, I, I, let me give, my, give you my personal example. Uh, the, the guy inside me, that subconscious person who is observing the target, is a, I think he's a five-year-old, and he is seeing the target through the quirky eyes of a five-year-old little impish kid, uh, and, and he's trying to describe to me what he sees. And in reality, some of the things they have observed with. Uh, uh, subconscious behavior is that the subconscious mind is a completely can be a completely different personality from the conscious mind. So the, there is a there's a difference of interpretation. Like I, I have to ask myself, what is this quirky five year old kid trying to tell me? <laughs> you know, and it's it's that person inside me. So so if there is a reality to the difference in in uh, 
psychological composition of the subconscious mind. And I think that, you know, if there's a little, let's face it, there's a lot of things that we do. We don't know why we shun away from this and we, we gravitate toward that. And we don't understand it. And it's because of the subconscious influences that we have that are driving us. And that's the same problem that we have in decoding things from remote viewing. Uh, a lot of associations we had in the past uh as a child, you know, that formed subconscious associations in our head will come to the fore and we will not recall that that's where, you know, we know where all this came from and we don't. So so what we do is we try to take the subconscious impression we're getting and bounce it back and forth against some of our conscious associations in the form of emanations uh, of thought and and try to, like, pull out those, those subconscious things into the light and say, all right, when I talk about apples as a kid, I'm talking about apple pie, right? and, and so you say it's a pie. And, and that, that, that way, that it's a process that we go through that isn't quite as apparent to us, and it, it's a very roundabout way, but it, it can, when it's done correctly, it can bring you uh, right to the target. And there's times when I know I have the target right, and, and it's like an inner knowing uh, as opposed to like an arrogant, uh, con- personal conviction that I'm right. Does, does that well, that's a, answer your question? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a, and it's, and I don't know if I'm learning more about remote viewing or your style of remote viewing, and that's my question, and we are going to leave that question. Every listener is mine, like, what is going to be your approach to knowing how capable you are of seeing the world outside your physical body um, so that you stop limiting yourself and at the same time tool yourself to be as objective and clear and authentic in your capacity to see beyond your physical body and remote viewing has definitely received a lot of scientific research and evidence that it does exist and that you do possess the ability so to hone your talent i want you to contact mike rogalski and join scars um, and the class is contact you can contact the classroom meeting me.com Mike, is there any other way they can reach you or anything that they read that you have written? Uh, no, there, I have, like I, I, I may have mentioned, that I have a book that I'm working on, a remote viewing manual, but they can have the, the, the manual that I've written up to this point the, the, without the, the latest revisions and illustrations uh, right from our website once they become a member. So they can get the whole, like, a 60-page manual on remote viewing right there. You are a most generous person to offer so many things free for us. I want to say, readers, that he has written a wonderful chapter in my and Mary O'Malley's uh, upcoming book. It's going to be out June 19th. And actually, Mike, if I can bring some books, if, they're, if they finally have re- arrived at my office, I'll bring them this coming Saturday because you have written a wonderful chapter on remote viewing uh, in a book called Your Soaring Phoenix because this is all about being able to soar way beyond your once perceived limitations. Mike, parting words to our listeners would be what? Uh, I have a, a phrase from Baba Muktananda that it says that the sun, moon, and stars and the universe revolve inside me. And it, it, it's a favorite because I finally came to understand what the guy was saying. I thought at first he was nuts, but, <laughs> you know, when you come from a scientific uh, background, you tend to think it's a pretty uh, far-fetched. But here's here's a thought for everyone that, that will blow your mind, and that is my my mind is not inside my body. Mm-hmm. My body is inside my mind. Wow, and that gives, that gives you a perspective perspective uh, that mm-hmm. what we're we're living through is literally a matrix. You know, mm-hmm. go see the movie again you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and get get a grasp of of what it means to be living a, a life uh, through a body that you've created within your own mind. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. And that reminds me of the Merkaba, or the Merkaba, which they say our field extends 50 to 60 feet outside of our physical body. Mm -hmm. And our heart center extends even farther. So here you are saying our mind. We are inside our mind. Well, thank you, Mike, so much for expanding us and making us realize that we can live much better than we thought we once could. Mike Rogalski, please contact him. Join the classes that he offers for free 
and do read his chapter in the book, Your Soaring Phoenix and His Written Material in the Future. Listeners, you are awesome. Exercise all that awesomeness and have a great day. Take good care, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Mike. Sure. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.